Hey there, this is Phil. Welcome back to the Holy Post Podcast. I am here with Sky Jatani. Hi, Phil. Hi, who's doing a really good impression of a Bond villain this morning, if you're watching on YouTube. I look the way I always look. I have not no. changed anything also, about my appearance. No. Also, it's the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 oh, you're right. It is. Well, they didn't know that. You didn't have to tell them that. Why would you even tell them that? And we also have here Caitlin Chess. It's Chess, right? I was saying Chess, and then someone said you said it wrong. It's Chess, and then I, I heard yeah. it correctly, but I guess they were paying more attention than me. So yeah, so I was yeah. It's Chess, like Chess. chess. Yes, chess. chess, like Chess, Chess, Chess. Would you like to play Chess with me? If you're, that's how your name is French. pronounced in France. When you go to France, everyone's going to want to play chess with you. <laughs> and now it's time for the theme song. What's the news that you like the most? Who's your favorite podcast host? If it's breakfast, get your toast. It's Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. Sky and Phil and the Holy Post. And sometimes Christian... Okay, Caitlin, you haven't been here in like a month or six weeks or something, quite quite a while. So what's been going on? What's happening? It was You haven't been here since before the election. That's true. Right? Like a few days before the election last time. Yeah, a few days. Yeah, yeah. So how are you doing? Are you accepting I, the results, Caitlin? Do you I accept, am accepting the results. <laughs> accept the results. Hmm. It is funny being at a church and having prayer requests right now because people are trying so hard to, at a church that has very different political opinions, trying hard to be careful in how they say things. And so we've done a lot of prayers for just very generally the political situation. <laughs> Yes, yes. God, we're not going to get overly specific, but I think you know what we really mean. There's a lot of winking at God. Wink, wink, wink. When I was a high school student in a youth group, we used to do prayer requests, and invariably half of them were what people would refer to as unspoken. Yeah. Is that a thing where you are? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Do you remember that, Phil? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, unspoken prayer requests. Yeah, Yeah. we had those. Because God knows what it is, but that always drove me up the wall. God knows what it is, but you don't want the the cute girl sitting next to you to know what it is. But why then do you have to say anything? Because you want God, you want everyone to know that you have a prayer request. Well, we all have prayer requests all the time, and the only person who doesn't is the dead person. You want everyone to know that. You... <laughs> why are we talking about dead people? <laughs> because the only person who doesn't have some need is dead. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. So why do we have to open unspoken? Or I've got three unspokens, which is you know this, I don't. That's just ridiculous. I have seven and a half unspokens, and I'm gonna speak the one half. My grandma needs blank. <laughs> <laughs> my grandma has a need that I shall not speak. <laughs> you, you, so. you, you joke about that, but in my church we kind of actually do that, <laughs> where it's like the I don't want to go into all the details, but there's something going on with so and so, and on. they'll like and they'll kind of leave the blank and why, they'll, why they'll can't, like lead why you can't, towards right. it. Why can't you just say, "Hey, my friend John really needs prayer right now. He's in a difficult situation." Yeah, it's never that. You, quick why can't you just <laughs> why, why say, "My friend John has an unspoken"? <laughs> well, then don't Mystery. speak it. Well, it's a code. It's like a card that yeah. you play in in the prayer game of life. Like I have seven unspoken cards that I can play. They're like wild with... cards in Uno. Yes, yeah, they're Uno cards. Unspoken. I need an unspoken stat. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess that could be anything. How do we pray? How, and it, Jesus told us to ask, seek, and knock. How can you ask if it's unspoken? It's like knocking without your knuckle actually hitting the door. Yeah, silent knocking. It's it's the biblical silent knock yeah. of De- Deuteronomy or seven. Seeking while you're blindfolded. Uh, Caitlin, know. Caitlin, Pet help peeve. us out because you, unlike us, are fresh in the biblical text from all your classes. When Sky went to to seminary, they were still using the King James, and they hadn't even translated half of it yet. So that doesn't. We work. were using the actual Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah, you were using oh, sea- how old they were. Yeah, sprinkled with sea salt. So, Caitlin, is it okay to pray for something unspokenly? My worry is that you're trying to make yourself sound more mysterious than you really are. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? It's a way to pick up girls. To pick up girls in youth group. 
Yeah, I make you many. sound more worldly, but but also have, humble about it. Oh yeah, I have many unspoken requests of the <laughs> things I've done over the last twenty four hours. And if you'd like me to speak them to you, why don't you meet me in the car after exactly. youth group? <laughs> People will come to ask you questions. That's part of the goal. <laughs> yeah, come to me when there's no adults in the room, and I might tell you this crazy thing that happened. Okay, that's not really one of our topics today. Um, we want to talk about the Southern Baptists. Everyone's favorite evangelical denomination. I'm not sure that's the case. Do you think that's safe to say? (laughs) I'm pretty sure it's not, especially if you're not a Southern Baptist. (laughs) Okay, well, what do you think is everyone's favorite? I don't think anyone has a favorite. (gasps) You don't think anyone has a favorite? I think a lot of Southern Baptists really like the Southern Baptists. They're not ice cream flavors, they're denominations. Aren't they? No. Well, they? Okay, if the Southern Baptists were an ice cream flavor, what would they be? Um, I know what they wouldn't be. Uh, they'd be vanilla with just like four <laughs> chocolate chips. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. Yes, but the chocolate chips get hugged a lot. As an apology for, you know, what happened with chocolate. <laughs> Caitlin, I apologize. <laughs> This okay. is not okay. Okay, this is not the topic, either. Oh no, my wife is texting me. Probably really important things. Can she oh. hear what you're saying right now? I, no, no, she can't. She just texted me uh, a link to a Downton Abbey jigsaw puzzle. Is, I, is this on her Christmas list? I guess. <laughs> now everybody knows what she wants for Christmas. This is a disaster. Okay, should we start over the podcast? It's gone horribly off. The rails. No, I need, I have some, I have a story. I have a story. I can't, I have so many things open on my desk. I can't even find anything. Um, Southern Baptist Seminary presidents, and that's seminary presidents, plural, because there are six Southern Baptist seminaries. Can you name all of them? Who can name all six? I, there, no. Who can name all? Uh, no. This is not a trading card topic that people collect. <laughs> I bet Caitlin can. Four tops. I, I don't think I could get really? six. Oh, okay. Uh, Gateway Seminary, Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. There's South or Southern or su- su- a derivative of South in a lot of those names. Well, that makes sense. And then there's New Orleans, which is Souther than any of them. Hmm. Okay, you know so about? what's the story? Oh, this no. You, oh, you want the story? The seminary yeah. presidents um, have together collectively vetoed any use of critical race theory as a thing that Southern Baptists can do or Christians can do. Southern Baptist seminary presidents have taken up a hot culture war issue in a recent statement, saying critical race theory is incompatible with the denomination's central statement of faith. So it's about Southern Baptists. It's not, they're not saying that no Christians can use critical race theory. They're saying it's incompatible with the most recent Southern Baptist statement of faith. We stand together on historic Southern Baptist condemnations of racism in any form. That's where they started. So that's the, you know, I still like uh, people that aren't Christians, but we stand together on historic Southern Baptist condemnations of racism in any form. And we also declare that af- affirmation of critical race theory, intersectionality, and any version of critical theory, any version of critical theory is incompatible with the Baptist faith and message. Do they define why? Well, first of all, do they, do they define critical theory and then do they explain why it's incompatible? Or do they just go, no, no we're not going no. there? No, they did not. No, they did not. It, uh, the statement does not offer a description of critical race theory or explain how it clashes with the core beliefs of Southern Baptists. But Daniel Aiken, president of Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in Wake Forest, North Carolina, offered an explanation, said the theory was rooted in Marxism. And therefore, uh, they all wanted to make it clear they could not endorse it in any form or fashion. Since Marxist theories are atheistic, Southern Baptists must reject the underlying framework for understanding the world. Okay, hold on. There you go. Everyone, there you go. hold your horses. So they're, they're doing go. the um, sort of is guilt the, by association. Or, or is it the no good Scotsman? I always right. like the no good Scotsman. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, b- based on this logic, the Southern Baptist Convention, I'm, I'm looking forward to their statement in which they declare that Christmas trees are incompatible with the Southern Baptist faith. What? Are because you- Christmas trees have a pagan origin. <sighs> Jesus brought us a Christmas tree when he was born. It was small. It was tucked in his diaper. And what what if like um, well what, what I mean Thomas Jefferson was not an Orthodox Christian, and he yeah. wrote the Declaration of Independence. So do we have to reject the Declaration of Independence because he it's was, clearly rooted in a non-Christian framework? He was handed the Declaration of Independence by Jesus. I've seen the painting, of course. Like that. This is I'm showing the absurdity of the logic that just because something has an origin which isn't Christian means we have to reject it. Yeah. Okay. Like where, where does the lunacy end then? Caitlin, tell him how he's wrong. <laughs> I mean, no, that's exactly the, I mean, is that going to apply to all philosophy, any science that was not done by a Christian, anyone that, because a lot of those, the the argument usually made is CRT is not just a tool, it's a worldview and that mm-hmm, there are yeah. foundational elements that are antithetical to the gospel. We learn from scientists all the time who have a worldview that is naturalistic that we would very, you know, fundamentally deny. The same would be true of really early Christians that relied on Platonism in in important ways to advance foundational Christian doctrines that we still hold today. And we would say, are some of those roots of of Neoplatonism not, you know, compatible with Christianity? Yes. But were there philosophical elements of it that were compatible that helped them clarify Christian doctrines? Yes. And those were good things. Yeah, the Apostle Paul quoted pagan philosophers. Yeah, I don't think they would deny any of those things. They would pick the one that is culturally relevant and gets them some props by the people that are most upset with them right now. Okay, what, so what would have made a lot more sense is if they actually defined critical theory and then explained here are the three reasons why it's incompatible with Baptist belief. Right, but they right. just jump over right. that and say it came from an atheist and therefore we can't have it. Uh, okay, yes, yes. The argument that has been thrown at me numerous times when I say I'm not really all that interested in critical race theory one way or the other, I'm more interested in, in racial justice, um, is yes, but critical race theory says that that guilt is based on race or your class. So if you're white, you're an oppressor class, therefore you're guilty. If you're black, you're an oppressed class, therefore you're you're virtuous. That is incorrect. Yeah, I know it's incompatible with Christianity. <laughs> but no, that's I think that's a false interpretation of critical theory or critical okay. race theory. That is a that is an but applica- some, but it, that's but an application taken- that's an application some people make using yes. critical race theory, but the theory itself is an interpretive tool. It's if not... People, if people can drive your car to a bad place, it means you have a bad car. <laughs> so critical race theory is a bad car because it can be driven to a bad yeah. place. It's a shoot the messenger kind of argument. Which is also morally wrong. Unless okay. unless the messenger is white, apparently. Oh, ha ha. Uh-huh. Okay, so uh, why do you think... Uh, Caitlin, why do you think this statement came out when it did to signal to the right people that they have, you know, kind of cleared themselves of any guilt by any person in the SBC that might have been accused of it before they can kind of say, no, we made this statement. And so broadly, I'm concerned that it gives warrant to anyone saying anything that could be construed as, as CRT being condemned or some way hurt even, you know, in their career, if they're a part of the SBC, especially at one of these seminaries. I mean, Owen Strachan, who's the head of, um, I think the Center for Public Theology at Midwestern, tweeted like two weeks before the statement came out that any form, any conception of systemic racism is rooted in CRT. And so we can't even talk about systemic racism without being tied to CRT. So So that's not part of their statement. I don't want to assume that's what they think. But he's also a really public person for the Center for Public Theology for one of those seminaries has said it th- that it's that broad. It's like that really gives them a lot of room to kind of, you know, condemn any statement from someone that doesn't meet. If so, if people are getting upset about it, they have grounds now in a really wide way to condemn someone for it. I think, I think there's another explanation as well for why this happened when it did. Yes, Guy. Uh, this is from Christianity Today. They reported that Donald Trump issued an executive order in September describing critical theory, including critical race theory, as anti-American and rejected its heresies based in race and sex in this country. So Trump used it just before the election as a boogeyman to condemn the left. And 
I think that got picked up by the media and it's found its way into conservative Christian communities. And so they want to make sure that it's a, it's a virtue signaling for the right that it's, I don't think it has much to do with theology. I think it has a whole lot yeah. to do with politics. Uh, Kyle Howard, who is African-American racial and spiritual trauma counselor, had this to say, the SBC is a denomination haunted by white supremacy, and ironically, the only system it doesn't want its people engaging with at all is a social science theory that specifically addresses its own heritage, which is systemic racism. Ouch. That's mm-hmm. kind of out. And then our friend Jamar Tisby um, said, uh, such statements make it unlikely that the SBC's attempts to attract more black churchgoers will succeed. He says the fallout is happening already, but it will become much more apparent in the years to come. These men in their intentions are not racist, but the impact of the statement is to put all the energy and focus behind critiquing efforts at racial justice when the energy should be toward rooting out the racism in their midst. So why so much enthusiasm over opposing critiques of racism versus just opposing racism? Caitlin, why do you, why do you think? Because mm-hmm. we're all trying to justify ourselves. <laughs> it's, it's a lot easier to kind of, and I, I have found in a lot of my conversations with people who pull the CRT label out to, to kind of end the conversation, it's often not something they fully understand very well, but it's something that's a helpful way to avoid anything that could implicate them in systemic right. racism or in the history of our country. It's easy to go, well, you're relying on this flawed tool. And even then I'll kind of go, well, here's all of this description in, in the Bible of how oppression functions throughout generations and communities. Here's why people are often held accountable for things that they didn't they didn't directly do, but they're impacted by and they have to unlearn and repent from. Um but it doesn't matter because to them, that's still CRT being applied to the Bible instead of scripture speaking for itself. And that gets people off of the hook. Have you found anything effective in addressing these concerns in your own interactions? I try and talk about the way scripture talks about those things, about God's people being implicated in injustice as naturally as I can. Like we talk about it in Bible study as it comes up in scripture naturally, because when that happens, people are a little more able to have a conversation about it and see it as naturally coming from scripture. Whereas when we've already started having a conversation about CRT, for example, the, the, you know, walls are up and people are less interested in hearing, even if it's just me quoting a Bible verse. So to me, a lot of times I tell people like the work of doing that comes way before the conversation you have with someone. If you've been having conversations about the way scripture talks about that for months and years, then you're prepped for that conversation in a different way. Whereas if the first time you ever talk about Isaiah or Jeremiah and the way they describe sin is in a conversation like that, people aren't going to listen to it. Right, right. Okay, Sky, any, and we have a we have an interview today and we have a guest talking about this, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, David F- Fitch has written about this in a thoughtful way, I think. So I asked him to come on and we had a conversation about it, which people can stay tuned for. Will they find it helpful? I hope so. Yeah, I did. I found it helpful. Okay. I think it, 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 this fits in within the larger, and we've talked about this in the past, the larger tension within uh, particularly white evangelicalism around personal responsibility versus systemic failure or systemic injustice. Right. And conservative side always wants to default to, it's about personal problems, it's failure of the heart, it's personal transformation that needs to happen. It's not systemic. And there's other Christian traditions that default too much to the systemic side and don't talk about personal transformation and holiness. And that's where this rift occurs. I think Southern Baptists generally, not entirely, but generally fall more on the personal responsibility side of sin and tend to have a little bit of a blind spot when it comes to systemic sin. Well, isn't that and, true and that, of almost all evangelicals? Yes, that it is. That was part of the evangelical movement was conversionism, personal right. decision, personal. And it's, it's a both and. It's not an either or. Yeah. And I think for the Southern Baptists to say critical theory, which obviously emphasizes systemic matters, is untenable within their theological framework it's a it's a way of broadly stating systemic sin or systemic injustice in general is not our concern and i think that's a little short sighted very short sighted well it's we've we've decided that people who talk about systems of injustice are probably liberal and the single most important thing is that we are not that 
That's my concern. It's, it's just, it's dividing issues up into liberal or conservative buckets rather than biblical buckets and then saying, well, mm, guilty by association. Sorry, your concern is in the wrong bucket. But, but part of the problem is even conservative evangelicals don't apply this. Um, they don't apply it consistently. So for example, when it comes to abortion, which we've gotten into in recent months with our video, oh boy, they tend to approach it systematically. It's not just a, a failure of an individual in getting an abortion, they believe it's a systemic injustice that needs to be corrected at the highest levels of law and government. Right, right. So there, it's okay to come after something systemically, but when it comes to racism, no, that's just a personal issue that needs to be dealt with in people's hearts. It's not systemic. So th we pick and choose what is systemic and what right. isn't based on our politics, not based on our theology. It would be interesting to, to go through writings, like the criticisms that you, not me, but you have gotten about the abortion video. Clearly, yeah, just I haven't gotten any criticism because I didn't make it. Um, or the criticism that I've gotten about my videos on race and just swap the words abortion and race in all the criticisms and see how the arguments shift. We should do that. That would be a fun. Yeah, and to be fair, this exists on the left also. Oh yeah. It is not just on the right. They have what? their they have their issues that they make personal and not systemic, and others that they make systemic and not personal. So it, it it's an for air example. For example. Uh for example, they they uh emphasize the systemic reality of poverty, but they don't want to talk about personal responsibility on many of those issues that, oh, that right. does genuinely right. exist. Right. Um, I'm trying to think of others that would would go the opposite way, but yeah, th there are blind spots both sides, and I mean, this even when it comes to science, like conservatives get criticized for not believing in science when it comes to global warming in some cases, but there are liberals who deny science around things like vaccines. Mm -hmm. The, the anti-vaxxer movement is pretty big on the left, so or gender and sexuality. Like there are scientists who are being now blacklisted because they actually believe in the categories sure. of gender scientifically right. and they're so each side has their they pick and choose what they want to affirm based on their politics right my my brother pointed out in one of the pieces he wrote uh i think it was i think it was about abortion but just the fact that he went through all the current textbooks biology textbooks quoting them that life starts at con conception Mm -hmm. And it's in all, because there's no other way to look at it. Right. There's just no other way to look at it than a new life starts at conception. And it's in all the biology textbooks until it becomes political. And you say, we don't know that for sure. That's just, it's just your, it's your religion saying that. No, mm -hmm. it's your biology textbook saying that. Okay. Did any of you see, um, Drew Dick tweeted out this column from the Oregonian. I don't normally read the Oregonian. <laughs> it's more of a Drew Dick thing since he now lives uh, up there. But it, it was called The New Religion of White Christians. It was written by Steve Dewin, D-U-I-N, Dewin. Um, and he quotes heavily from a local pastor, a, a Portland pastor that I had not heard of named uh, Rick McKinley at Imago oh, Day Community. Oh, uh, yeah. Rick's a friend. What? Yeah. We got to get him on the podcast. Yeah. yeah. He's a good guy. Okay. And so, let, unless he says something terrible in this article that I'm unaware of, in yeah, which case well, I've well, never met go. him. Here we go. So, <laughs> so Steve, Steve, do it. You have it on record that Sky is endorsing whatever I'm about to say next. <laughs> Steve Dewan says, he's talking about the situation of white evangelicals today. I know a multitude of Christians who are still feeding the homeless, reaching out to prisoners, and welcoming immigrants and other strangers to the neighborhood. But the raw, primal energy of an evangelical movement that finds salvation in Donald Trump and Republican control of the Senate? And then he quotes Rick McKinley, uh, lead pastor at Imago Day Community in Southeast Portland, who says, we have a new religion that's nationalism with Jesus' face on it. It ties in very nicely into the desire of white people to never experience any kind of marginalization. Uh, and apparently Rick has a, uh, a book, I, I don't know if it's coming out or out, Faith for This Moment, Navigating a Polarized World as the People of God. Fearing change and increasingly disheartened by their isolation, too many white Christians find relief and security in political combat and national ethnic 
pride. Uh, McKinley writes, the greatest threat that we Christians face is not the rejection of our values and beliefs in the public square, but our own participation in the stream of culture that shapes our identity more powerfully than our faith in Jesus does. That sounds like something Caitlin might have said in, <laughs> in, in her book. Um, so there were a couple of things he said that, that caught me. Um, he said when he talks about the moment we're in right now, he says, when George, when George Floyd was killed, it seems we were listening to black leaders for about two minutes. Then the discussion was taken over by white voices on both the left and the right. In those moments, the white evangelical church has little to say to the world. They grasp for for some theology to justify their comfort. If we deconstruct Black Lives Matter as anarchists or Marxists, we can write it off. Uh, And then he quotes um, Emmett Wheatfall. Do you know Emmett Wheatfall? Is that another friend of yours, Sky? (laughs) No, I don't. Do you know everyone that I could ever mention? Okay. Emmett Wheatfall is a black poet and pastor in Northeast Portland, and he agrees with McKinley and says, what we see now from evangelicals is more political posturing than Christian teaching. We're mixing secular political positions with the gospel, and the New Testament is being choked out. I think it's funny that his name is Wheatfall, and he talks about choking out. Like, oh, you know, it's just like the parable, the weeds that choked the out the tear. The, 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 yeah, yeah. wheat fall choking out. Mm-hmm. Wow. Very poetic. Did, and he's a poet. I'm, I'm glad you're here to point that out because now I lost all the energy of what I was doing. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> Okay, are we mixing secular political positions with the gospel, and is the New Testament being choked out? And if that's the case, couldn't it be choked out as much by too much political activism on the left as on the right? I defer to Caitlin. Okay, yeah. Caitlin, (laughs) hey, do you know anyone who's written a book about politics and the gospel recently? (laughs) I do. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, it is so hard because we are always reacting to whatever happened immediately before us, the generation prior to us, and even the generation that we are a part of. And so I think your last question is it's a hundred percent possible that we can replace, you know, one kind of secular political position choking out the gospel and think that we're moving away from that and end up adopting another secular political position that chokes out the gospel. Um, But on the other hand, sometimes people see both of those possibilities and go, okay, let's just not be involved at all because it's so impossible and it sounds like both of these pastors, I, I don't want to do what Sky did and give blanket authorization to anything they've ever done or said, but it sounds like, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we need though, are people who can be pastoral and prophetic in particular contexts in order to see what's happening and say what needs to be said to their people at a particular time or place, because kind of giving a blanket statement, political statement that as if that will exist for all time and be able to guide the people of God, no matter what comes in the future is a recipe for us repeating our mistakes in the future because we've swung, you know, we're always correcting, but if we don't have the kind of ability to see where we're going now and prevent ourselves from being overcorrected, then we'll lose it. But I I really hope that, you know, these two men aren't doing that. And I think a lot of people put a lot of pressure on national leaders and like denominational heads or whatever to kind of chart the way forward. And that's so abstract and it's so hard to see what's happening in particular communities that like, what I really want to see, and I'm biased because I'm in a seminary, but what I really want to see is pastors and also lay leaders in local places who can see the particular needs of their context and respond so that we can engage politically without falling into a ditch on either end. Yeah. Sky. Well, I, I mean, again, Caitlin is always right. I have, I'm going to give Caitlin a blanket, Ooh, wow. blanket put that on, statement put that on the cover of your next book. Um, Caitlin is always right. She's always right. The, and the, Phil, what would you say about Phil? Uh, he's always talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Phil's always right too. Um, Don't patronize me. The but the, the I think the issue isn't necessarily that pastors are endorsing bad. Uh, theology or they're saying they're taking political issues and incorporating them into the church. I think it's just that they're remaining silent. Yeah. And as a result, the vacuum is filled by what people are consuming everywhere else and they are integrating it with their faith. And because their pastors aren't challenging that, they don't recognize there's something wrong. Right. We have the, we have the, the mega church pastor in Florida who spoke out strongly against Trumpism 
after he retired. <laughs> yeah. um, we have Andy Stanley, who spoke out kind of against Trumpism after the election. Uh, what does it say that these two voices are both in Portland? Right. There's I pastors mean, in Portland. I, I like Rick a lot. I've, I haven't talked yeah. to him in years, but I do like Rick a lot, and I think he's a, he's a, a very good leader for Portland. Um, but there's not it's not a hugely risky position to take to criticize Christian nationalism. Yeah, you're or, not yeah. likely to lose your pastorate by taking a more progressive position in Portland, just the same as taking a more conservative position in Dallas right. is, is not going to shock anyone. But I, I want to amplify the voices, you know, because most evangelical Christians do not live in Portland. So they are not getting a Portland perspective on the gospel. They're getting much more of a Dallas uh, you know, Southern U.S. Uh, perspective on the gospel. Here's a, here's another quote from McKinley. And okay, I want you to react to this one. Scripture would tell us the way we heal this divide is through sacrificial love. And I don't know that the American church is willing to sacrifice. Loving your neighbor? What does that mean if wearing a mask is too much for you? Hmm. <laughs> Okay, then he goes on. When you look at where real persecution is happening in the world, this is the American version. We can't do whatever we want to do during a global pandemic. It's the furthest thing from persecution, but that's always the trump card. The evil, wor the evil world is taking away our rights and our religion. And then he summarizes it by saying this, the gospel was never about protection. It's about proclamation. It means you go out into that dark, scary world and live a different story. Phil, a couple of weeks ago, you mentioned uh, the growing divide between religious Americans and secular Americans. And you said our hope is with church leaders in very secular, primarily urban environments who can yeah. show us how to be a faithful Christian in that setting, right? I did say that. And I think Rick is one of those people. He, yeah. It, it's true. It's a very progressive city and it's very post-Christian and there may not be a ton of personal risk for him to take these kinds of positions, but he's also showing that you don't have to be afraid of being a Christian in that environment. Right. And like so many other issues, whether we're talking about LGBT issues or immigration or race, when people are living in homogenous communities where they don't know anybody who's gay, they don't know anybody who's an immigrant, they don't know anybody who's a different color, it's easy to fear and demonize them. And it's right, easy to do that right. with secularists and liberals. But how, how, Sky and Caitlin and Jason, how do you avoid, okay, you know, you're a pastor and you live in a community with a large LGBT Q community. So, you know, you're just kind of sliding over to say things that please them. Or you're a pastor who lives around a large, you know, immigrant community. So you're just pushing the gospel over to please the people around you. Uh, you know, what's the difference between I'm bringing a different perspective because I'm in a different setting and I'm cha I've changed my perspective because I'm kind of pandering to the people that are around me. Caitlin. Caitlin's on staff at a church right now. She's, she faces that <laughs> dilemma, don't you? Well, first, I think to, to answer that direct question, I do think, I mean, you need accountability from people that you trust for leaders, especially to kind of figure out what are my real motivations for things? Because yeah. you going into a situation and thinking, I want to learn from people who are different from me is very different from, I want to be accepted by them, or I want to like gain clout, you know, with their crowd. Um, right. So checking your own motives and stuff. But I do think it's strange. I had a conversation recently with some people who were talking about how all their kids are in social work or they work in public schools. And so, of course, you know, they have political disagreements with them. And it was so strange to me that like that was taken as a bad bias instead of are we listening to people who are working with the most marginalized, vulnerable people and actually taking at least their opinions as as valid, if not more because they are with the kind of people that Jesus would have been around, you know? And so I, right, I don't right. want to say like, okay, then, you know, if they've become much more liberal or more, more progressive politically, then we just listen to everything that they think and say that's, you know, 100% right. But like, should we give a little more weight to people who are really working among the most marginalized and vulnerable people in, in the world mm -hmm. um, or in our communities at least? But also I listened to the to the podcast where you talked about the the you know, polarized world and the rural and the urban people. And I kept thinking in my own context about how 
I need more people here. Like I want people to go into Portland or to New York and to be among people who are very different from them and to evangelize. But honestly, in Dallas, I feel like I meet more people who are culturally Christian but have no idea of the real gospel. And they're not going to get it by someone who is a believer and comes in to witness to them and yet is unwilling to step on their political toes when it becomes necessary. And the community of people that I'm around here, because we tend to find each other, are the people trying to do that and facing a lot of backlash and finding it incredibly difficult and personally really painful. And I understand why that's not attractive at all to anyone (laughs) to try and do that kind of work. But the whole time I was listening, I was like, I think we need people, like you have to feel really called to go to New York and be like, I'm going to talk about everything, including sexuality, including, but you have to also feel really called to go to a Southern, you know, rural church and be like, I'm going to talk about sexuality and I'm going to talk about immigration and justice and those kinds of things. And I think sometimes we shift back and forth, which is the more popular of those things to think we might all be called to do. And I really just want people to feel like, you know, God will call you to whatever he calls you to, and you should be faithful to that, even if it is, it's going to be painful in both places. (laughs) So you kind of just got to figure out what he's saying. Are you calling for missionaries to rural America? Please come. (laughs) I'm not in rural America. I'm in Dallas, but we have our own. Oh, no, rural. But you're in rural Dallas, right? You're in the rural parts of Dallas. What is rural Dallas? (laughs) That's like talking about a dry rainforest. What? (laughs) There's cows somewhere in Dallas, or at least cowboys. Or or are you saying country is a mindset? It's not a. Oh, yes. It's not a. Country Geography. is a state of mind. Uh, Sky, do you have any, any anything you want to add to that before uh, we wrap up? I mean, we've. I don't want to bore people with stuff we've said in the past, but oh no, we would want to do that. I do think part of it, 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 it's about local pastors, yes, but it's also about those who are in leadership above them in denominational leadership yeah. or regional leadership, and and asking what are you really measuring? How do you define faithfulness or success in ministry? Unfortunately, in a lot of places, I think it comes down to institutional metrics. Are there more butts in the seats? Is there mo- more money in the plates? You know, is and that's that's what's measured and valued. So to be controversial or to preach something or say something that would upset people or maybe lose some people would be seen as a pastoral failure rather right. than a success. Right. And and we need to begin with Jesus' own ministry and look at how did he gauge success. And there were moments like John 6 where everyone left because he was teaching really hard things. And yet he did that in obedience to his father's will. So I think a lot of it is we just have the wrong uh, definition of ministry success. And therefore we keep our mouths shut and we don't challenge things that need to be challenged. I mean, look at Paul's letters when he writes like the Corinthians, he says some pretty crazy stuff to them about how they're off track and how he's ready to come at them and bring some wrath of his own. And like, I'm not saying we do that, but the fact that we aren't willing to risk some of those institutional um, metrics of success, I think that's a lot of the reason we're in the situation we're in. Okay. Uh, uh, Tell me what you think about this idea. What would happen? What would be the result if you made pastors rotate through different geographic regions? So you do a year in New York City, and then you do a year in Topeka, Kansas, and then you do a year in Portland, and then you go, you know. So you ha- if you forced rural pastors to go live in the city and pastor in the city for a couple of years and, and urban pastors to go out in the country. That's what, what the Methodists happen- used to do. Yeah. Would, I mean, that's their model. Would, would the pastors, what would happen first? The pastors would change their perspectives or all of the people would stop attending all of those churches? I, I wouldn't say all of them, but I think you would see those churches decline. But they, I think those who remain committed would be uh, healthier and probably more faithful disciples. Right. Right. Caitlin, Caitlin, you want to agree that that's one of the best ideas you've probably ever heard? <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin, it's my it's, show. I don't think it's, it's a my bad show, idea. Caitlin. I, I worry, though, too, that like, I, I feel like you need a balance of getting a bunch of experience in different places, but also... Some of the most like faithful people in my context who have weathered a lot of pressure to conform to people's political preferences are people who've just been so committed to one place that they know yeah. it so well and they know the people well. And so maybe you could do like 
a little bit of that moving around in the beginning and then you plant you just somewhere shot a, you just but. shot a hole right through my the head of my idea you just shot it right in the head you but that that was the vision between i killed I, it. behind itinerant preachers right don't make a congregation too dependent on one pastor don't make the pastor too dependent on one congregation move them around that was the methodist idea for a long time and there's wasn't something it, to be wasn't said it for also it. a shortage of pastors that led to that? right yes yeah, so there was a practical pastors. reason for it as well but yeah. uh, it's kind of like the argument for congressional term limits like yeah. everyone thinks it's a great idea, but there's also an unexpected downside to it. And there is a downside to not having pastors with longstanding relationships or knowledge of a community right, and their right. ability to shepherd that that place. So it, it's I don't think there's a silver bullet solution here. Other so maybe than, it's a part of seminary training that you have to do an internship completely outside of your social political upbringing. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. Mm. Like if only pastors actually went to seminary. That might help. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're, well. we're a dying breed. Okay. Uh, Caitlin, what do you have coming up? When is your next book coming out? What can we promote? Oh, nothing. No. <laughs> <laughs> How about any unspoken prayer requests, Caitlin? Tons. <laughs> so many. Yeah. Any for your friend John, in air quotes? John, I think John is I have struggling. a lot of friends. I have grandparents. You can unspoken prayer requests for all of them. Uh, uh, Caitlin's book is The Liturgy of Politics. We've been promoting it on the show for months now. It's at the top of some chart, I'm sure. Uh, it would be a great Christmas Somebody. gift or stocking it's a, stuffer. There you it's go. A, mm-hmm. Yeah. And stuff your stockings with some Caitlin Shess. 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 Excellent. <laughs> and then we go to France. I'm surrounded by Germans on this podcast, aren't I? <sighs> you, Jason, are you German? Uh, somewhat. Mostly yeah. Welsh, but some German. Oh, okay. okay. I feel okay. I feel like Holland. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You'll be fine, Sky. Mm. You'll be fine. Okay. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, Guy. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everybody, for listening and supporting us on Patreon. Uh, go follow. Uh, Caitlin's fun on Twitter. So what's your Twitter handle? At Caitlin Chess, if you can figure out how to spell that. Yeah. Just spell it like chess, but in France. Um, and that's all I think we all what we have for today. And we'll talk to you next week. Thanks, everybody. For many of us, the nativity story is one of the most familiar in the Bible. It's a story we tell our kids, and it's one that we come back to year after year after year, which is partly why it makes it more difficult during this Advent season to really discover something new about the birth of Jesus or to read scripture from a different point of view. But that's exactly what we're going to try to do this month in With God Daily, my daily devotional for people who hate daily devotionals. We've started a new series called Christmas Psalms. We're looking at the Psalms through the point of view of the nativity story. For example, Psalm 4 finds David talking about anger, and we juxtapose that with the way Herod's anger leads to great evil and destruction. Other Psalms are directly messianic and are actually quoted in the New Testament. This won't be your typical Advent devotional, but if that's what you're looking for, I encourage you to go check it out at withgoddaily.com. A donation of any amount will get you signed up to receive the devotional five days a week, and you'll also be able to download the mobile app and get access to all of the archive series, as well as the audio devotional, which you can listen to rather than read. As always, if you can't afford to make a donation right now, you can still sign up for free by going to withgoddaily.com and contacting us directly. I really believe it's important to make this devotional available for free to those who can't afford it. In fact, we even give the devotional away to people in prison and on death row. But that's only possible because some subscribers donate generously to make it available to others for free. And at the end of the year, if you're thinking about your giving and you'd like to contribute to the expansion of With God Daily, again, you can go to withgoddaily.com and make a one-time donation of any amount. I hope you find encouragement and inspiration through the Psalms this December, and hopefully through With God Daily all year long, you discover what a deeper, more meaningful relationship with God can really look like. And thank you to everyone who's made this ministry possible. So we've already talked about critical race theory and critical theory in general and how the Southern Baptist seminary presidents have denounced it as incompatible with Christian faith. Well, I want to continue that conversation now with my friend David Fitch. A few months ago, Tim Keller wrote a really good piece about justice and how different philosophies of justice conform to or diverge from the biblical and Christian perspective on justice. We talked about that on the podcast. Well, not long after Keller wrote his piece, 
David Fitch wrote a piece critiquing Keller's piece. You can find that on the Jesus Creed blog at Christianity Today, and we'll put a link to it in the show notes. After reading that, I thought David would be the right person to have back on the podcast to help us better understand what critical theory is, what we should affirm about it, what maybe we shouldn't, and why are so many people bent out of shape about it? David Fitch is the Lindner Chair of Evangelical Theology at Northern Seminary near Chicago. He's also the founding pastor of Life on the Vine Christian Community, a missional church in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. He also coaches a network of church planters within the Christian and Missionary Alliance, which happens to be the denomination that I'm ordained within. And he's written a number of great books. We've had him on to talk about some of those in the past. But he brings together a keen philosophical and theological mind with an understanding of where we are as a post-Christian culture and the practical realities for the church in this age. One quick note before we jump into the conversation, my time with David Fitch was recorded before the Southern Baptist Seminary presidents had issued their statement about critical theory, which is why it doesn't come up in our conversation. Okay, here's David Fitch. David Fitch, welcome back to the Holy Post. Grateful to have you back with us. Always good to be back with you, Sky. Thanks for having me. We have long history together. We'll try not to get off into those little cul-de-sacs of, of our own polity and, and interests too much. Right. I want to talk about what our audience wants to hear. Okay, so a couple of months ago, Tim Keller wrote a piece about justice, and I think it relates to a larger book that he's now done on this issue of justice and how it relates to the Christian faith and all the different streams of and visions of justice that seem to be prevalent in our society. You have interacted with Keller, at least in writing, through the Jesus Creed blog at CT and some other, I don't know what other forums, but I've been kind of reading both of you guys. And the reason I wanted to have you on is because we are hearing tons of people talking about critical theory, or in some cases, critical race theory. It's sort of the new boogeyman for conservative, politically conservative, theologically conservative Christians. And I've appreciated the clarity with which you've written about it. So can we talk about that? And can we start off by just, can you try to succinctly define what critical theory is for people so they, they understand what we're talking about? Yeah, succinctly is going to be really difficult. This I morning. know. Yeah, on, this, on this issue, but can, I, I, I'd like to take a stab at it like this. Uh, Post-World War II, uh, after the complete destruction of Europe by Nazism, by Hitler, you had a whole bunch of intellectuals uh, people who thought actually before World War II, Marx was going to save the world. Actually, they thought uh, industrial capitalism was going to move into Marx and instead it moved into fascism. It moved into Hitler. And so people are asking, how did this just happen? How did, how did millions of German Lutherans go Heil Hitler? How did, uh, and by the way, aren't we all asking similar questions today? How are Christians aligning themselves with a certain public figure and going Heil, whatever. And so they're coming out and they're asking, how did this happen? How did this formation happen? So you had the, like the Frankfurt School post-Marxist critical theory asking, how did good Christians become Nazis? Okay, I think it's a good question. And I think all of us are asking, we should all be asking, how are we being shaped by the cultural ideologies of our day? And I think that's what critical theory does. You get the word critical from not just accepting Marxism, but being critical of Marxism or critique of ideology. So critical theory is breaking down all the layers of cultural frameworks that shape the way we think and feel to make us go Heil Hitler. How's that for an explanation? <laughs> That's very colorful. Thank you, David. <laughs> so, I mean, based simply on what you said there, I can't imagine anybody being upset about critical theory. It's just, it's good cultural analysis. And isn't that what the Apostle Paul does in some of his epistles? Isn't that what Jesus does when he's engaging with the Pharisees and, and, and deconstructing some of the assumptions that his culture carried? And you have heard it said this, but I say to you that. So why are so many conservatives and particularly conservative Christians losing their minds about critical theory? Yeah. OK, so most most of us Christians, even if we're younger than the age of 30, most of us grew up 
in a cultural system, a culture of Christendom, where the, the large culture was one, at least in our, the way we were living, it was one monolithic cultural construct. It was Christendom. And no one questioned uh, sexuality issues. No one questioned uh, our white people versus uh, we're all equal. It's all Christian. But here in the last 20 years in the United States, it's been going on in Europe for years. Here in the United States, uh, we've been breaking up into multiple cultures. Uh, we are no longer all Christians. That's become obvious. We are, we are no longer a Christian country. For a lot of us, that's become obvious. And so a lot of us see, I call it flat epistemology. A lot of us are still thinking in one framework. And if you try to deviate and break down and undercut that framework, uh, with cultural analysis like we're talking about. Well, you have now become a relativist. Well, you are now accepting culture's understanding of justice, that it's it's different for different people. And that starts to really freak us out. The breakdown of Christendom has really led to the need for critical theory, and if you ask me. Okay, so then interact a little bit with, with Tim Keller's thoughts here, because he uh, breaks down, I think, four different understandings of justice, and he references critical theory as one of them, and he primarily puts it into a secular category, and I don't want to be unfair, but is is largely dismissive of critical theory as a useful framework for thinking about justice. What do you think Keller gets right, and where do you think he's a little uh, off base in just utterly dismissing critical theory? Yeah, at the risk of being critical towards a very good man, and I do think Tim Keller is a very good man, I see Tim Keller as coming out of the frameworks of evangelical Christendom, and therefore critical theory is a threat to the cultural hegemony of Christianity. You, you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, I'm, he's one of those Christendom people, I think. Do you think I'm right? I don't know. I mean, his context for many, many years, decades has been Manhattan, which most people would argue was well ahead of the curve in losing a Christendom assumption of culture. So yeah. are you saying that Keller and those like him are trying to preserve something that doesn't need to be preserved? I mean, uh, you know, most people uh, in the theological world know me as a neo-Anabaptist. And a neo-Anabaptist says the worst thing we can do is try to preserve Christianity on the back of a universal rationality or, uh, let's say, the U.S. government or uh, worldly power or even corporate systems. You know, we we got to be true to one person, and that person is Jesus, and he is Lord of the world, and he will work things out in a different way if we will let him and make space for him. But so, but, but I would, I agree that uh, Tim Keller is in New York City, a very diverse multicultural place. Uh, that doesn't mean he's not working out of Christendom frameworks. And so when he says critical theory or critical race theory uh, is not a basis for justice, I think I would agree. I think Michel Foucault would agree. I think uh, Derrida, Jacques Derrida would agree. I think Louis L. Touzer, all these critical theorists, I think actually Derek Bell would agree. I think ta Coates would agree um, that it's not a basis for uh, building a theory of justice. You know, Derrida famously said something like, uh, uh, justice never arrives. As soon as it's locked within a linguistic discourse, it becomes uh, coercive, power centric, and and we lose our sense of justice. I think all critical theory is is more diagnostic than it is basing a substantive theory of justice on. What do okay, you think yeah. about that? Yeah, this is this is the part that I I appreciated about what you wrote in your. In your section about critical race theory, you say it's useful as a tool of diagnosis. And here's your quote. At their best, these cultural theorists teach us how to ask good questions, make astute observations, locate voices. It can open space for the work of God and Christ to reconcile, heal, make bodies whole, put into place various attractions, reactions, and other formations. So in other words, you're trying to say that critical theory or critical race theory is a useful tool for understanding what's going on in a society, but it's 
it falls short of an actual framework for, for justice itself. For that, you need something like the gospel. You need a, a Christian vision of justice, which is, so a lot of people are mistaking the thing for the, for the tool that diagnoses it. Is that what you're, exactly. you're saying? Exactly. It's kind of like saying uh, the doc, the doctor, you, the oncologist you go to to diagnose cancer is the cancer, you know, <laughs> it's like, because no. he's giving you the bad news. You're going to b- b- shoot the messenger essentially. Right. Right. And so critical race theory really helps us understand the social cultural dynamics that are shaping us. Most of us white people are not aware of the whiteness we live out of critical okay. race. Yeah. But before we get it, we'll get into that in a second. Before we get into the good positive use of critical theory, how do you see it, in, perhaps in the hands of, of, of uh, strict secularists, how is it misused? And could that explain some of the reaction against it? When it is utterly divorced from a Christian vision of justice, does critical theory end up becoming destructive or uh, in, in some way abusive? Or is that what Tim Keller and others like him are reacting against? Yeah, I mean, I'll put it like this, uh, a, a psychologist, um, uh, a Uh, a psychiatrist, uh, a counselor, Uh, therapy can be good to break down uh, what's going on in our histories and our our psyches and can diagnose psychological illness. But if we think the psychologist can totally heal us, that's where I think we get, we turn in on ourselves and, and we look to ourselves to solve our problems and we come, we become narcissists, therapeutic deists. That's just like therapy can be a good tool, but if taken too far and not pointed to a reality that is bigger than us, Jesus Christ is Lord, it can turn bad. So can critical theory. Critical theory can do, you know, bad things to gender and sexuality, but it also can expose a lot about what we need to know and understand that's going on in sexuality and gender so that God can, we can open space for Jesus to heal our antagonisms and brokenness. I think that's a really helpful metaphor because I mean, you, you know well that there are fundamentalist Christians who throw out any kind of of psychoanalysis, psychiatry, therapy, because they say it has pagan origins or secularist origins and therefore is to be shunned entirely. Whereas I would argue more evangelicals or more, more thoughtful Christians would say, yeah, there may be some non-Christian origins to these tools, but they're useful. And when in the hands of somebody with a Christian vision and worldview and rooted in the gospel can be very helpful in moving us closer toward Christ and healing. So likewise with critical theory, some people are reacting against it simply because it has Marxist origins or secular philosophical origins, but that alone should not make it anathema to us. It, It just means we need to be using this tool in the hands of, of godly Christian vision rather than utterly secular one. Is that fair to say? Oh, that, that's a great uh, summary. You know, I teach culture studies at Northern Seminary, and, and I think understanding how ideology works, understanding how, how the, the structures of gender, sexuality, race, poverty, economics work is absolutely essential for us to enter the world and make space to proclaim the gospel. Uh, I just think it's a new day we're living in. It's not 1952. It's, it's, it's some new world my dad never dreamed of. Okay, so then let's, let's turn the corner to where you were going before, which is g- give an example of how Christians ought to use, say, critical race theory as a diagnostic tool that leads to healing or redemption. Yeah, well... Um, uh, by the way, you can find this article that Sky and I are talking about on Christianity Today, uh, Jesus Creed blog. But he, he goes into Keller goes into discourse and uh, he says something like uh, the, the main way power is exercised is through language or discourse. And um, folks, this is so true. We do not understand how our language. I'm going to use a ideological word ensconces us places us, shapes us, forms us into thinking certain ways uh, that are based on power structures. And so 
uh, one of the critical race theories realization is whiteness is a dominant standard paradigm for a way of moving in the world. It's linguistic. It helps us talk and think about things. And, and the ironic thing is it's not just affecting us white people. It's affecting black persons who now have viewed whiteness as the standard that I must aspire to. And if I don't look like this, think like this, talk like this, have a degree like this, uh, do it this way, walk like this, well, then I am less than. And so uh, a framework, a discourse helps us understand what's at work and how power is shaping us into thinking we're better than other people or looking down on people. Christians don't do that by who we are in Jesus Christ. But to even understand what we're doing, we need to understand the frameworks. That's what the brilliance of what critical theory, critical race theory does. So if we take that example, I would assume that a, a, a total secular solution then would say we need to police people's language. We need kind of PC uh, on steroids where, uh, you know, you use the wrong language and you're going to be shunned, you're going to be uh, canceled, whatever it might be. What, what is a Christian response then to that reality look like, which is more redemptive and less um, punitive? Yeah, yeah. I, I always say this. I say, piece by piece, we must have a dialogue, a conversation with those who are not us. Like if you're a black person, have a conversation with a white person, white person with a black person and allow our language and, and what it's doing to people to be exposed and then to slowly repent and allow our frameworks to be reshaped. Uh, I'll give you probably even more resonant one example of this. That some of your audience might appreciate. Let's take sexuality, for instance. There's a whole frame. It's relatively new. It's about 150 years old. It didn't exist prior to like the Victorian novels where sexuality and heterosexuality is based in all these ways that men look at women and vice versa. Therefore, women look at men. There's a gaze there, right? And and we never get issues that are false in that framework if we don't look at the framework. Hold on, hold on, David. Your mic just went out on me. Like it's all muffled for some reason. Is this better? No. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's like. Hold on. Oh oh. Uh, hold on a sec. No, that's better now. Actually, I don't know what it happened. Is? Yeah. Talk for a is second. Uh, testing one, two, three, testing. Yeah, that's better. I don't know. It sounded, it almost sounded like a shirt or something went over your mic. All right. I don't know what happened. Bummer. Okay. So um, go, go back to the, the Victorian thing. Yeah. Um, what we need to understand in sexuality is there's a framework that we have all uh, been ensconced into. Does, does your audience know what I mean when I say the word ensconce? Oh. Ensconce. Let's say shaped by, right? Immersed in. Um, Immersed, absorbed, and shaped right. by. And so, by the way, there is this really sick view of attraction that's built into this view of heterosexuality in the way men look at women and women look at men. We never get to that. If all we do is affirm heterosexuality, then we affirm gay sexuality, lesbian sexuality, other sexualities. We never get to the actual frame that it's built on if we don't expose the frame. And all this other Me Too stuff and everything else and these injustices never get what's the what's the basis of it? It's the way we look at each other, objectify each other, commodify each other, contractualize. Marriage. We never get to that. We just re-perpetuate right. uh, it if we don't get to the frame. The same thing with whiteness, with, with all these other frames that we're trying to sort ourselves out. Capitalism has its frames about, oh, are you successful or not? How I, and, and Christianity needs to break down the frames if we're ever going to engage the culture for Christ. So essentially what you're, what you're saying is there are all these assumptions that we live with that we, we are shaped by, that, that dictate the way we operate, and we just need to dig deeper and unearth some of those assumptions and look at them and be critical of them, which is where you get critical theory from, and ask, at least from a Christian point of view, do these frames conform to or violate the gospel? 
the way we yes. are to interact with each other. So even in the pages of the New Testament, I recently I've been writing in my devotional about the church and I've been kind of camped out on 1 Corinthians 11 for a while, which is about the church uh, taking communion and Paul having all kinds of criticism of them. And in Corinth, the rich and the poor were not sharing the same table in the church. They were right. divided. And it, it appears from Paul's writing that the Corinthians didn't see anything wrong with this because in Corinthian culture, the rich and the poor didn't share a table. That's just yeah. how they operated. They never questioned it. But Paul comes yeah. in and says, hey, wait a minute. The way you're doing things may be the Corinthian way, but it's not the Christian way. It's, it's yeah. incongruent with the cross of Christ, and you are under judgment because of what you're doing. So essentially, what critical theory is asking us to do is to take that lens and ask, the way we operate economically, relationally, racially, politically, economically, we need to analyze, dig deeper, and just question some of the assumptions under which we operate. Is that a fair summary? It's beautiful. And uh, uh, by the way, we need skilled pastors to be able to lead congregations through this. This is not easy work. Well, I, I don't want to say it's it's not easy work, but it's it's different work. We haven't been used to doing this those of us who grew up in Christendom, were ne we were never questioned about sexuality or race or whiteness or economics or any of that. Uh, we're living in a different time. So, okay, let's get back then to what the controversy is really about. If, if we were to gather, I don't know, five evangelical thought thoughtful people or Christian people and five total atheist secularist people, and we had a conversation around what's broken in our society, what is wrong and unjust, we may all employ these critical theory tools to analyze what's broken, but a disagreement may arise in what the solution is. But it seems to me like a lot of conservative Christians are freaking out about even using these tools because they're, they're threatened by them simply because the secularists are using the same tools, therefore we shouldn't. Is that... Is that kind of what it comes down to? We're just reacting because the people we've opposed are using this tool so we can't? Yeah. Yeah. Frankly, I, I don't have too many conversations with these people who oppose critical theory, and I don't know why they don't come onto my Facebook page or whatever. Uh, but it's but thrown I, out there like, it, like a, it's a conversation ender. Oh, you're using critical theory or you're a fan of CRT, therefore you're a Marxist and you're not a Christian. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, I could go into a little theological diatribe on why I think certain per, uh, certain traditions in the Christian faith, like certain versions of evangelicalism or certain versions of Reformed theology are, are just bent on wanting power and control over frameworks. But here's the reality. We are not hegemonists in our culture anymore. We are not a Christian nation. We are not a Christian culture. And so give, so in order to be willing to engage critical theory or critical race theory, I think you got to be first willing to give up the idea that there is one monolithic framework uh, that is correct and we have it. And everybody who doesn't agree with us is wrong. There's a way of entering the world that's different. It's called incarnational. It says we must understand the languages and the ways of being so that we can open up space for God to transform and work in those spaces. That's what critical theory does. Okay. So then let's, one of the criticisms I've heard of critical theory is that it sees everything through the lens of power and victimhood that you are either in power and therefore abusing those under you, or you are a victim who's being abused by those who are in power. And this is, Tim Keller gets into this a little bit. And the secularist might say the only fair correction to this is to invert those roles, that the person being subjected to uh, or subjugated needs to be put in authority and those in authority need to be put in subjugation. What's wrong with that from a Christian point of view? What is it missing in its simplicity? Well, first of all, I just want to say uh, one of the great uh, post-structuralist critical theorists of power is, is Michel Foucault. And basically all he ever did, kind of following Nietzsche, and I know I said the word Nietzsche, so now everyone's going to turn off your podcast. <laughs> but uh, he basically would uncover how power is at work in our various linguistic structures. And, but he never 
he would never maddening in, in a maddening way. He would never like make a judgment, a value judgment. Is this power good or is this power bad? This power is just power. Mm-hmm. Well, um, so I think just exposing the power that is at work is a net good for all Christians to understand. But here's, if I can put this in like three sentences or less, Christians need to understand, and I think we've abnegated on this, that the way God works through his power is very different than the way the world works with their power. Worldly power is power over. Jesus says, we are not like the Gentiles tyrants over. We are among and with and it's the power of his presence at work among us. Once we get that there's two powers at work, and by the way, uh, all the post-structuralist critical theorists, analysts of power who want to just invert power, have the same flat view of power that I think most Christians do in our culture. One, there's only one power. But for Christians, we need to understand, no, there's another way that God is at work. And this is the power of Jesus Christ by his presence at work in all things, not just internally, but in social systems, if we will make space for him to transform the world. Your Anabaptist colors are beginning to show, David. Um, Proudly. Yeah. Uh, years ago, a couple of friends of mine wrote a book called The Way of the Dragon and the Way of the Lamb. Yeah. Are you familiar with it? It's about ministry yeah. mostly. Um, yeah. But it, it kind of gets at that. The Way of the Dragon being this coercive uh, imposition of power from above and the Way of the Lamb being this bottom up power, this power of, of servitude and coming among this incarnational approach, which, which God exhibits throughout the scriptures, but certainly most clearly in Christ. So um, I think this is really important because when people, I think, react to critical theory and critical race theory, I think what they're reacting to is the secular vision of it, which has that one dimensional view of power. You either have power or you don't. And whoever has it, abuses it, and whoever doesn't have it is a victim. But Christian visions of power recognize that there's worldly power and godly power, or there is this way of exercising power, which is actually righteous. Uh, it reminds me of Andy Crouch's book, Playing God. Have you read that yeah. or seen that? Yeah. So, I mean, he I've read it. I reviewed it. Yep. Okay. Well, I don't know what you thought of it, but I appreciated the fact that he doesn't just dismiss power as inherently bad. There is a form of power in which we reflect the power of God, which is good. So um, toward that end, what do you make of this uh, tendency from the left to label everyone as either an abuser of power or a victim? Yeah. Is that something the church should affirm in some way, or do we just reject it entirely? I mean, I think about myself, there are instances where I am clearly an abuser of power and there are other instances and weird ways where I feel like I am the victim, but I'm not, I'm never just one of those things. And that's what kind of chafes against me with some of the critical theory stuff I'm reading about from secularists is they want to take a single bit of my identity and make me one thing victim or victimizer. And and that doesn't seem to resonate with the, the more nuanced way of looking at people from the gospel's point of view. Well, okay. So like one charitable comment towards critical theory on this. I think if you look at all the bases, all the various streams of critical theory, uh, feminism, critical race theory, uh, uh, economics, I think people are coming out of a space of being abused. Literally, a lot of the people writing this stuff have been abused by systems or patriarchies or economic oppression uh, enforced by capitalist ideologies. Okay, so, uh, oops, I probably said something that'll turn other people off your podcast. Sorry about that. You're, you're gonna be down to like one listener after this is over. Hey, but that's anyway. why you're just a guest and not a host. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, dude, uh, they are coming from a place of abuse. And I really do believe you gotta give people time to unwind the pain and the abuse. And, and there's a lot of anger there. And folks, uh, uh, if you've been abused, it's okay. Uh, that is part of the healing process. Secondly, though, I'll say this. And, and I think Christians have gotten sucked in to a flat view of power. I think uh, we're seeing it now. I mean, do, do we ever stop to ask why all these uh, mega church pastors, 
why all even John Vanier, for Pete's sake, uh, becomes a, a sexual abuser. It's because the power is toxic. And I, there's this guy named Reinhold Niebuhr who said, no, power is power and we can't escape it. It's always going to be there. We got to make good use of it. By the way, I think James Davison Hunter does that in his book to change the world. I think, right. I think that's all a big mistake. Thank you, critical theory for pointing it out. I think there is another way a a completely different way um, that God works through presence, relationality, Think of the triune God, three persons in one, perichoresis, relationality, and it breaks down systems. You think of the way Jim Crow in the South was first disrupted by these little prayer groups called Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committees. They would meet and they would disrupt just by being present with one another, loving one another, refusing or resisting to be part of these disgusting uh, Jim Crow laws and just disrupting with a smile on their face saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And it disrupted the whole Jim Crow and led to the civil rights movement. That's a different kind of power. I think Christians need to read critical race theory, see the power at work, even in our own systems and make space for Jesus to work in a completely different way. Okay, let, let me play devil's advocate for a second, David, in our, in our remaining minutes. I agree that, that some of those relational disruptions in the Jim Crow South were effective to a degree, but even, even Martin Luther King Jr. understood the economic dimensions of segregation. And so the bus boycott, for example, 1956 in, in Montgomery, Alabama, he understood that it isn't until we hit him in the pocketbook that people are going to begin to rethink segregation until it becomes too costly economically to maintain segregation will the system change. So even King resorted to a form of coercive power in order to change the system to make it more just. Was that wrong to boycott the, a bus system and, and, and withhold financial support of a system that was unjust? Of course, uh, uh, MLK was the great practicer of nonviolent uh, engagements. And these he viewed as all nonviolent engagements. He didn't view going sitting in a Woolworth uh, uh, at, a, at a fountain uh, as, as violence. Uh, refusing to go on the buses was in no way nonviolent. Yeah, but OK, but hold on. Violence isn't the only form of coercion, though. Uh, uh, I choose not to. Uh, this is a famous like uh, Slavoj Žižek ta tactic. These are tactics. Yeah of nonviolence, of presence, of exposure of the evil and the systemic power at work and saying, thank you, I choose not to participate. And when you choose not to participate, what? You're not gonna participate in this power structure? No, I don't need it actually. I can go home and eat a uh, hamburger after I'm done sitting here and not paying for a fountain drink at Woolworth. So um, I, 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 this, this is what I don't think it's uh, if I had a parting shot on, on your podcast, I would say I don't think we realize the power that is at work in the world. If we will just allow space for Jesus to work, convict through these tactics, which I would view as a completely different way to engage the world through nonviolence, through the power and presence of Jesus, through mutuality. I agree. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to argue that there is a difference between nonviolence and non-coercion. Like you can be very coercive and not use violence. Yeah. I mean, these are, these are tricky terms that we're <laughs> probably going to have to have another podcast about. Um, and, and really I think coercion is not always, did I get my gun out and point a gun at you? Right. It is, right. uh, it's force of systemic, this is, I think, what critical race theory exposes. Whiteness, very, very few percentage of white things that are coercive towards a black person have anything to do with pointing a gun at a black right. person. Although we know exactly. manifestations, it, but it's still coercive. But yet the presence of God is never coercive. The presence of God overwhelms with love, faithfulness, conviction, and this is the way God wants to change the world. By the way, I believe that's systemic. God wants to change the systems of this world through non-coercion. And, and I think where we would agree is that that needs that, that systemic change needs to be manifested within the community of believers, the church, 
first, first. and foremost, and, and not just to give give it moral credibility in order to change the rest of the world, but to show the power of the gospel to actually change things. But if it's not happening in our communities, in the church itself, why would we expect to have any influence anywhere else? This is the massive failure of church today. And it happens a lot when Christians get powerful. It happens a lot when we align ourselves with the state. It happens all the it happened with the nation of Israel. I, we want a king like the Gentiles do, right, who will come right. in and force their will on us, blah, blah, blah. It's always the temptation. It must be resisted. There's always got to be a faithful church to show the way. Well, David Fitch, I, I really, really appreciate your insights and in writing on this because I'm still wrestling with it. I, I really love the fact that you identify critical theory as a useful tool rather than an end in itself. I'm grateful that you bring good theological truth to bear. And I'm still wrestling with the, what does it mean to use power in a non-coercive godly way when so many of the even godly examples we have, I'd argue are still coercive. I don't know what to do with that. So I'm, I'm not finished with this, but I think we're finished at least for today. Well, you know, you invite me on like once a year. So next year, this will be our topic. Okay. We'll come back to it. We'll put a pin in it and we'll come back I'm, to it. I'm writing like a two year tome on power. So maybe right. two years and come on. Yeah. That's what you're doing on your sabbatical? <laughs> no. I'm writing, the, I'm writing the proposal for it on my sabbatical. I got other Okay. Things. Well, get, get going. We need this. I want to read it. And we'll definitely have you on to talk about it. I would love to. And it's always okay. good to be on with you, my brother. Always good. It, likewise. Thank you, David. The Holy Post Podcast is a production of Phil Vischer Enterprises, that's Phil's company, and Sky Pilot Media, that's Sky's company. Production assistance by Julie Betcher. Editing by Jason Rugg. Help us create more thoughtful Christian media by supporting us at patreon.com forward slash holy post. Also, be sure to leave a review on iTunes so more people can discover thoughtful Christian commentary plus ukulele and occasional butt news. Visit holypost.com for show notes, news stories, and more.